All right, thanks. Yeah, my name is uh, Ted Spears. Uh, I work for Micro Semi's Programmable Business Unit. We do the FPGAs for Micro Semi. My role there is to define our FPGA roadmap, so in product planning. If people aren't familiar with our FPGAs, we're known clearly for low power, reliability, and security. Our involvement with RISC V, I think, kind of got in fairly early, and I am on the RISC V Foundation Board of Directors, so I'm actually here not just representing the Micro Semi hat, but also uh, the RISC V Foundation. The reasons that caught our attention early on were, you know, opportunities for innovation around the, the processor in the areas of low power, security, and reliability. You know, I just felt the openness of, of the architecture would enable a kind of a future roadmap where we can uh, really focus on those and innovate in those differentiating areas. At the time, we also, you know, competitors, uh, Intel and Xilinx, have their own soft processor called uh, Neos in one case and Microblaze in the other. And uh, we didn't have one at, at the time. So it looked like the time was right and had a customer who needed a, a RISC five or needed a processor IP. And, you know, RISC five was there and we uh, actually worked with uh, Sci five actually and uh, uh, now sell a version of the, of the, the uh, Sci five processor as our own. Want to design with that with that processor, and actually just took a first multi-million uh, dollar order for it uh, uh, this month, as it as it turns out. We also support other people making RISC five cores, and in fact, we've shipped hundreds of thousands of of units uh, today using RISC five. You know, other companies RISC five implementations, IP companies per, to be exact, implementations of RISC five in our products. And so we're happy to we have a, something called the My Five ecosystem. We got Artos. Uh, you know, people who make tools, people who make solutions, and people who make IP are, are you know free to join our My Five ecosystem. Them, and we're happy to promote anything uh, related to uh, Risk Five through our ecosystem. Uh, my name is Navid Sharwani. I'm the president and CEO of Sci-Fi. A quick introduction to Sci-Fi uh, was started by the the original three inventors of Risk Five from Berkeley, and subsequently we have uh, acquired most of the team from Berkeley, and then the team from Stanford, and the team from MIT. So we have 35. 40 PhD students and other students who were actually working on it since 2010. It, it's, it's, a, it's a fun group to work with. Uh, our focus really is two things. First of all, make sure that we have a very good roadmap of RISC-V IP for our customers. We are talking to 30, 40 top customers in the world and basically building a roadmap. Uh, we'll share that with you guys uh, very soon on our website and otherwise. And the second thing we are doing is that we are building a chip design platform which will use these cores and many other things, which will enable two things. Number one, it will dramatically reduce the cost of prototyping. So let's say if the current cost of prototyping is one million for one platform or seven million for another platform, we will get it down to 100K or 750K. So that is our publicly stated goal. Why? Unless we can dramatically reduce the cost of prototyping, hardware innovation is not going to happen. Period. The big difference between hardware and software is the prototyping cost in software is extremely low. And how does that happen? Because they have a software stack. They use 95% of the open stack, and then they only build 5% on top. And very crucial part of this prototyping uh, reduction of cost is a program called Design Share. And we are very happy to have people like Mahesh from Analog Bits, Jeff from Press Logic, I think. Camille is here. Many of our friends, all are here. Farzad is here. So all of you guys are participating in a, a design share program, which basically says, how can we get this IP to people who are trying to prototype, rapidly prototype, based on some existing templates, extremely low cost. Once they are successful, and we know in ASIC business, only one out of 10 are going to be successful. Then they have the ability to raise money, and they can, they can pay us. We think that that kind of prototype system should be on the cloud. It should be available worldwide, and it should be so easy to use that uh, I keep on mentioning two guys in Brazil in a garage should be able to get to silicon, which is completely impossible today. And I think unless that happens, innovation moves out of Silicon Valley, out of India and China. I mean, right now, innovation is stuck in a few places in the world. It needs to happen everywhere in the world. So we have made a public commitment that all our software and all our things will be available to all universities 
worldwide for free. And we will start with the 50 of the poorest developing countries in the world, and we'll make our software free there as well. So the whole idea really is to get the innovation going. And I think Risk Five is the best excuse that hardware has ever invented to get that going and use that to promote the open source hardware platform as well as the innovation. And I think we are very committed at Sci5 to make that happen. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Emerson Shaw. So I'm the uh, head of uh, Endis Operation in US. So Endis is a CPU IP company. So the only focus is CPU IPs. Uh, so we were funded in 2005. So back in 2005, I remember we still have a lot of standalone IP, uh, CPU IP company like uh, MIPS, ARC, and Tensilica. Uh, there was this question that why, need, why we need another CPU company. But we saw a need that the consumer uh, electronics or consumer ASICs required to have more uh, computing power and also be able to last a longer period of time. Our focus is really on the uh, high efficiency uh, microcontroller IPs. Uh, and it was a great success. So we, we went IPO in 2017. And up, t up today, we have about 150 customers worldwide. And the stories begin uh, in 2016. I, ta I was talking to uh, Rick O'Connor regarding joining force uh, with RISC-V. And then it was interesting, uh, open source hardware, like uh, we said, this is open in innovation, right? And then immediately we decide, yeah, this is it. So because, you know, we've been hearing from customers, we're tired of being tied to one company, uh, one ecosystem. We want to have open ecosystem. We want to have open innovation, right? So we jump on a trend in 2016 as the funding member, and then we release our first two risk five core in 2017. We're expecting a few tape outs uh, this year on a risk five product. Uh, we also plan to release a few uh, new uh, risk five product line uh, this year, and it's going to be. Uh, I think it's going to be exciting uh, years for Endes. Thanks. Thanks, Emerson. I'm Art Swift of Esperanto Technologies. I see a lot of familiar faces around the room. I'm standing in for Dave Ditzel, who I think you all know is a, one of the most famous computer scientists of our generation, who uh, co-authored with Dave Patterson, the pr professor at Berkeley, The Case for Risk, which was the original technical paper which spawned the whole risk revolution in uh, 1980. Dave's sick today, so I apologize that I'm standing in. Uh, my own legacy goes just as far back. Uh, my first CPU-related job was working on chips that went into the Cray computers. So Cray Research was my first customer. And along the way, I was one of ARM's biggest customers. I was VP of Marketing for DEC Alpha, VP of Marketing for Spark, VP of Marketing for MIPS, CEO of Transmeta, consultant for Paul Odellini at Intel, and now VP of Marketing at Esperanto. I'm also uh, vice chair of, of the marketing group of the RISC-V Foundation. I think I can bring a little perspective on a RISC-V to all of you. And I can tell you honestly what decided Esperanto uh, in favor of RISC-V as we develop our high-end AI chips was that we had the opportunity to innovate on the RISC-V uh, instruction set. We could extend it, we could participate in the open working groups, we could be a, a contributor to the community. And so we saw it as a really great opportunity. It is the platform for innovation for the next 10 or 20 years. Now that's a, sad to say that the other players really haven't provided that same opportunity for innovation. If we wanted to innovate on an ARM platform and take a multi-use license, it would have cost us millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, we certainly couldn't do it on an x86 platform. And then you might imagine with uh, Dave Ditzel's history and in instruction set architectures, we considered developing our own. But when we studied RISC-V, we also found it was very efficient, could generate very small cores, and could be very power efficient while delivering high performance. So we decided there's no reason to create our own ISA. Uh, this is a great one, so we embraced it. Anyway, look forward to uh, working with all of you in the future. Series of questions, and actually, if we have some time, I'll actually we'll walk it, maybe the microphone, get some of your uh, questions as well, so actually get some interactive uh, nature of this audience. But I've got, I think I've got a few questions to get started here. And I guess my first question is, if you could, if you could pull one factor for RISC-V, what was the most compelling aspect of RISC-V? Was it the free, the extensible, the low power, the small size, or just the fact you can innovate on a, an open platform? Well, when I got uh, engaged with RISC-V, 
I thought the innovation part and the free part were the most important. In the last one year, I've been convinced security is the biggest part. I think the security is the killer app because I think anything which has historically been there for a very long time, it's going to be very, because we'll be patching security, right? We'll, we'll patch all kinds of stuff. But something which is open, fresh, new, modular, scalable, I think we have a much better chance. I'm not saying we have a solution today. All I'm saying that we have, as a community, we have a much better chance to provide the security. And I think in the coming years, security is going to become more and more important. It went so much more important that sometimes we will be willing to trade performance and trade size for it. The history of the uh, computing has been that we have blindly gone with performance uh, and tried to blaze through not paying as much attention to security. I think in the last RISC-V Foundation workshop, uh, Lytton, who is the director at DARPA, gave a good talk, and I remember one foil from him, and he says, the most secure is the most open. And I, I see India doing that, I see China doing that, I see everywhere they're embracing RISC-V because I think the hope of having more security. So to me, I think it's the security which is at the top of my mind, which is gonna drive this revolution forward. Yeah, you asked the question to pick out the, the one factor, but the reality is, I mean, it's just a lot of things that, that go into play. So the, so the openness, security for sure, the opportunity to innovate. At, a, at the fourth RISC-5 RIS workshop in MIT, I was standing with a Jim Hogan, a venture capitalist, and he was just looking around the room and saying, look at all the young people here. And it really, uh, RISC-5 is making hardware cool again. So it's part of, it, it's ultimately it's part of a movement. And I think uh, that certainly has a personal appeal, but I think that's what's gonna make it big because you know, all these things matter, the openness, the security, low power, opportunity to innovate, et cetera. So. At the last TSMC symposium, one of the co-founders of RISC-5 is a guy, Young Sap Lee, he's very young. So they were serving drinks at the end, and he actually got carded. <laughs> so I, I, I think in, uh, in, in sci-fi, you find so many young people, this is very common. It's very refreshing to actually work, because I always tell, work with young people, they don't know what doesn't work. See, our problem is we know way too many things that don't work. And so that's working with the young people, that's a big benefit. I thought this joke is appropriate. Well, I second that. I, when I talked to Yang Su Li uh, last year, he was the youngest guy in, <laughs> in the symposium. But what's the most compelling reason? I think it's the open uh, ecosystem because that allows the, uh, we can bring together a lot of resources and expertise into this community, right? And that will introduce uh, innovations. A lot of good things will happen on this one. And then in exchange of that, you're going to have a lot of users. You're going to have a lot of applications. I, I think that's the the whole reason and the best reason to embrace this uh, movement. So let me just add one thing to those remarks. I tend to agree with all of them. Uh, in our case, building a very high performance SOC for artificial intelligence and machine learning, we needed an architecture that was very scalable, very energy efficient for thousands of uh, cores on the one hand, and yet high enough performance to do high-end cores that could deliver single-threaded performance rivaling that of a 72 class processor from ARM. So we need an architecture that could span that whole range and yet was free and extensible. So for us, that was the main motivator. Back here, oh, so, so I would call that last one scalable because it went from, ver from small cores to very large core. Which leads me to another question is, which segments does uh, RISC-V address and or at least which assessments are probably maybe in, in what order? I mean, uh, because it's a scalable, extensible architecture, there really isn't a segment that it can't address, uh, unless you want to go 8-bit, uh, which is the very low end of the microcontroller space. But where, where, do you th where do you see it fitting in first, and then, and then how does it migrate over time? Yeah, so you're right. It is, does apply to any market, and, you know, our soft core, uh, the the high volume application I mentioned uh, is a basically a camera application that it went into, and you could call that consumer or IoT. But uh, we're also seeing uptake in bread and butter market, which is the defense segment. So I don't really see any limitations on on the actual segment. Yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. I think uh, sort of from the market reality perspective, what I, I see that. Risk Five is probably going to start with kind of an embedded applications, uh, lower end, and then slowly move up, uh, which is 
true for many product uh, so I, i think it is in the similar category and i think a software is a very big part of it and because i think in the case of embedded since that problem is somewhat controllable limited i think that nvidia switching all their falcon cores to risk 5 i think is a is a very good example and so far has worked very well for them and i see that happening because in a modern soc there are anywhere between 5 to 7 microcontrollers negotiating with some large ip company those seven microcontrollers you switch one there's a lot of hassle trouble problems issues and then of course money and then royalty right that is an obvious place where i see talking to the customer this is most of the time they are talk i totally agree that i think esperanto's attempt at the higher level we are 100% supportive of that anybody else who does anything else we are 100% supportive of that because we think the architecture is modular it is scalable and it should be tried it just effort needed for the high end is long uh, and hard but it has to be done i clearly see one day uh, supercomputers built on risk 5 uh, being available at lower cost lower power all over the world and i see that have happening as well so what so many expertise and resource bring into the community i think the sky is the limit it, it, it pretty much can go everywhere but just it's in the long run but in reality uh, it will have to start from somewhere right because um in to you know reality is that the ecosystem is ecosystem is still somehow limited today Uh, I kind of agree with uh, Nambi just said that it will start from more like embedded application uh, that design does not require a lot of support from the e- ecosystem side and then once it gets some success come tractions it can expand from there but I, I think in the long run this is going to be everywhere I truly believe that it just have to start from somewhere Well I just like to say that the Risk 5 community has hit a key milestone just recently and that's the availability of Linux capable silicon from Sci5 because now we can see the development community and you can get all the Linux developers excited about Sci5 and uh, Risk 5. I see that as a really key milestone because from there you can see, you know, communities like OpenWRT and you can go after the router market and gateways and so on. Once you have a really capable Linux, then you can begin to explore application processor potential. I don't even write off over time that you could see Risk 5 in true mobile devices. Now that might be 3 or 5 years from now, but I think it's a definite possibility. So, congratulations to uh, Sci5 and hopefully you'll have thousands of dev platforms out to the community as soon as you can. Let me give you an update on that. You know, I've been in semiconductor business since 1982. There's nothing you can announce or do that you get a response. So when we announced our U54, which is a Linux-capable core, 6,000 people contacted us. When we uh, released our board, the Linux-capable board, we had 500. That's the maximum we could build. I think it was gone in like two days. So right now, biggest problem we have is that we don't have any more to give because they're all has sold out and we'll make more badges. And we did our uh, one hackathon in Portland. amazing amazing software was done we will will write a little white paper about that and four or five very nice pieces of software were brought up in two days on our linux capable core so a lot of good things are happening in that direction as well so i have a, a a slide which shows kind of the adoption paradigm who's aware and ctos at all business all major companies are clearly aware of of risk 5 seeing if there's a strategy to develop around risk 5 the deeply embedded application for instance nvidia very public with I think their next gpu will have more than 10 uh, risc fives deeply embedded on their gpu governments india looking at at adopting risc five as a national processor backing the, the just the claim of innovation i think startups are all very aware of risc five and are using risc five the whole point of this is to launch a new wave of startups uh, hardware based startups in uh, silicon valley in the world they're definitely great i think highly aware i think that's happening they're getting funding risc5 is is got a big opportunity there two examples uh, one is called uh, green wave based uh, out of europe does some uh, image uh, processing at very low power another company in san diego i think it's called reduced energy microsystems also n- another example of a startup adopting risc5 all right so this is a been a great uh, sci5 love fest here I I I I'm going to ask some little little more tougher questions and and I think these are hardened IP uh vendors here uh, that that need some uh questions answered about sci-fi and I think one of the ones that everybody's going to care about is because it's a rel- it's a new architecture and a new 
platform, who's responsible for validation? I mean, if I, if I license an ARM core, I know I'm going to get an ARM core that's been validated by ARM and then software I know is going to work. And even if I do an architectural license, it comes with a validation suite that I guarantee that my core runs all the ARM software. So for Sci-5, how does a, a customer know for sure that the software will run consistently amongst all the different Sci-5 implementations? But from the foundation perspective, uh, one of the most important working groups is what we call the compliance working group, which is uh, developing a uh, official RISC V uh, compliance test suite uh, that will be formally verified. And so, if you you don't you can use RISC V, you're free to use it. If you but if you want to call it a RISC V and put the RISC V label on it, you have to be a member of the foundation, and it will have to pass this compliance suite, uh, and that is definitely. You know, I think job number one for the foundation is to get compliance suite out in the marketplace or finalized. So I think if you look at uh, the investment that people have in ARM, you actually, almost everybody ends up doing a vertical software stack. And that's why you see people in Broadcom, Qualcomm. What we are trying to avoid in RISC-V is that there is this common stack. And I, I think this is what uh, Ted was talking about. But other than that, I think as far as the rest of the validation is concerned, I think experience, at least at Sci-Fi, what we are trying to say to our customers would should be any standard core-based IP that they get, all the collaterals and everything else that they are used to getting, we will provide that collateral. So the experience of acquiring IP from us should be no different. And big difference we have is that we are also building a chip development capability along with our course. So people who don't want to implement themselves, we are more than happy to actually implement their design with our cores and take responsibility for it working in actual working silicon. Not only we will back up our IP, we are willing to back it up with chips. And so people who would like to go down, we will ensure that as well. So uh, I think that having a guideline from the uh, foundation is really the way to go that so to ensure that everybody follow the same rules. And also the other thing is I believe that every vendor probably have all the incentive to make sure the quality of shipping, uh, their shipping will be combined to the uh, risk by standard. Uh, from, uh, from our side as an IP supply, uh, supplier, we stand by all the IP that we ship to make sure and warrant the quality of the IP, the compatibility of the IPs. From our perspective, this is actually no different from a traditional IP model. Uh, all the IP that we ship will warrant, will guarantee the compliance and also the functionality. And I suspect many of you have seen uh, Dave Patterson of Berkeley speak about RISC-V, and he's very proud of something, that the entire RISC-V instruction set architecture fits on one page, the so-called green card. So it's actually quite possible for an engineer to understand well the instruction set architecture of RISC-V, where that's almost impossible, for instance, on a a CISC processor like the x86, and to some degree on ARM as well. The instruction set is so much simpler, it results in chips that are easier to build and easier to validate. So I, I think it's inherent in the architecture. The, the, the performance testing, I think, is going to be important, and that's the, the foundation does need to deliver. Do you have any timeline when that's going to be delivered? I do not. MicroSemi is the, the chair of the uh, compliance working group is from uh, MicroSemi, a gentleman named Stuart Hode. I could get that answer for you very shortly, but I think the goal is definitely uh, within probably by the next workshop. RIS-5 has a cadence of workshops, and so uh, there'll be a pretty large event in this building, end of November time frame. I, I would expect or hope to see an announcement around then, the availability of the compliance suite. Yeah, because it is more than just the instruction set, because you have flags and how flags are handled, corrupts, and all those. There's aspects of the microarchitecture that aren't just necessarily instructions, right? A key distinction here of RISC-V is it is not a processor. It is the ISA. And, and so a lot of those aspects that you've mentioned, you know, are the responsibility of the implementer to implement. Compliance Suite is just going to cover what is actually an official ISA uh, expectation. Testing the uh, uh, implementations of the cache, there are some uh, uh, profiles which are, uh, you know, how the interrupts work in a, a Linux system and so forth that will get tested. Hope of, of the RISC V is is to have the ISA, but then let people innovate with it and build the, the right microarchitecture for their application. Uh, Emerson, do, do you, 
At, at Andy's, uh, how are you going to validate? I mean, that's one of the value adds you bring to the market. Uh, to uh, anybody could uh, download from GitHub and, and build their own core, but you're providing a standardized core with with uh, validation and support behind it. You think the the operation of a core and how it you know how it relates to flags, how it relates to interrupts, is important uh, to standardize, or is each 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 uh, micro going to be different? Well, it's going to be, so I think that the compliance part is going to be kind of, uh, I would say, kind of minima compliance. And then so everybody needs to be compliant with that. But on top of that, you have all kind of micro microarchitecture implementations. And it's hard to kind of make sure everything, a uh, piece of paper, and everybody just, uh, just follow instruction. And besides that, if you do that, it actually limits the uh, capability of the processor or the instruction set. Uh, as Ted just mentioned, that uh, we should have some kind of compliance test in a very short time frame. Uh, we, as a vendor, we're going to make sure that uh, all our processors are going to be compliant with the uh, minima set. And then there's going to be other implementation, microarchitecture, that uh, everybody's going to uh, do their own. So to make sure that they get the most out of the uh, instruction set. On the verification side, if I can make a comment on that. So I think on the verification side, we actually don't write RTL by hand. We are trying to write formal verification for our core generators. What it means that no matter what core this core generator generates, would be formally verified. I think from the whole hardware, from whole verification point of view, that would be a very big step if we are successful in doing that. We, we think we have about year and a half, two years to go to do that. But we can already verify parts that our core generator is doing today. Having a formal verification of your complete core generator, that will simplify the overall process of verification quite a bit. I'm talking about the verification side now. So is that beyond the, the risk five core, or is that for your whole SOC? No, this is, this is just for the risk five core. Can you extend that beyond that? No. We might do that, but that's the current work we are doing is formally verify that. I mean, the, you can combine other t uh, ver verification techniques to do an uh, SOC, but uh, just using theorem proving to do formal verification, I, I just wanted to point out that would be a, a great scientific accomplishment if you are successful. Just to amplify on one thing that Naveed said, uh, as a startup company, we haven't announced when our chips are coming out, but we're well along through the design process. But I have to, have to say, with the chisel design tool and then the art capability to create RTL, we've long been running simulations on RTL in real time. You know, the modern simulation environment, the combination of like a virtual simulation platform, uh, the ability to run on RTL, the ability to run an FPGA, uh, you've already run all the validation suites long before you've taped out a chip. The modern design methodology really points to uh, this being a pretty straightforward verification process. How you actually validate an RTL by doing that on an FPGA? We will offer a service where you could actually do that on the cloud. So you could have as many FPGAs for as long as you need to do that. So that not only reduces the cost, but also the maintainability, but also the ramp up time and being able to run many, many versions of that at the same time. 500 FPGAs, you could quote-unquote, rent 500 FK. How can we do this? It has a lot to do with how RISC-V architecture works and how simple it is to do something like that. So that's another announcement uh, we will be announcing soon. That will simplify, at least uh, on the RISC-V core side. Uh, so uh, I just want to take it, amplify something, take it a little bit of a different direction, but he mentioned uh, these uh, brilliant people working on uh, the formal verification. And so one, another market segment for RISC-V is it's basically taking over academia. So computer architecture being done all over the world, all the major universities are uh, switching to RISC-V and it lets them come to conferences and they're all speaking the same language now. And so they're making innovations, but they're all on the, on the foundation of RISC-V. And there's, there's pockets of academia that are special, specialty is formal verification. But now they're all working on the same thing now, formally verifying. Chris Dasanovich, uh, the, one of the inventors at, at Berkeley, I didn't like the joke, but I said, you know, Berkeley's cranking the risk fives out and MIT's making sure they work. There's, you know, MIT has a lot of world-renowned experts in formal verification, and, they, and they're, they're all over this. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Well, that's it. So is Chisel an essential part of uh, getting RISC-V to market fast? Or is it more traditional RTL 
tools um, still valid? So I'm going to just put the foundation hat on before I pass the mic quickly. But yeah, the Chisel has got nothing to do with RISC-V. I mean, it is a, a tool that the uh, Berkeley guys use and, and love, and Sci-5 has adopted. But it, it, I don't want uh, Chisel to be coupled with the foundation and with RISC-V. So that's a, very clear. And actually, at Sci-5, we don't want our customer experience has anything to do with Chisel. So what we are trying to do is to move one level up. So if any of you have a chance to see uh, our platform, it's a very high-level interface where you are able to do uh, you know, configuration of our code and do everything else that you need to do. The entire code base of Sci-5 is 10,000 lines. So this is the power of Chisel. But we use Chisel as an internal tool. It is greatly efficient for us, but we don't see that as a part of experience for our customers. Uh, so we're actually taking a different approach. I, I think that high-level language is, uh, has pros and cons. Uh, so the pros is obviously you go a lot faster, less codes when you do, uh, do a new design. And then the, the cons will be that when you have a problem, let's say you have to debug because now it becomes a machine code. It's very difficult to, to see what's going on. But we take a more, uh, and just take a more conventional approach that we use our uh, existing uh, designs and platforms and we just replace the instruction set. So I can reuse all the ver verification suite that we have built up before to make sure that uh, the CPU is uh, it's also fully verified. Yeah, we see Chisel as a rapid prototyping tool. Yeah, you can imagine in a high-end design with thousands of cores, uh, traditional RTL and traditional optimization techniques are really important. And the kind of code that Chisel generates is not as easy to debug for an experienced engineer as traditional RTL. So we're a believer in both, and we think it'll, uh, Chisel will apply in certain circumstances for companies that want to get to market very quickly. But uh, larger chip companies probably will continue to use traditional RTL design approaches. One benefit of Chisel that I think several people have reported the, since code is not written by hand, it is machine generated, the FPGA bring up time is dramatically improved. If you had written a code by hand and have written by many, many different people, it probably takes you 25, 30 days to bring it, bring it up in FPGAs. I think it's very routine for our customers and our internal teams to report that we do it within a day. If the underlying RTL has a certain schema and if machines generate RTL, you know, that schema. Now, I completely agree. We are so used to optimizing the RTL code by hand, and it's going to be very difficult to get that kind of performance out of the machines when they are writing the RTL. But for most purposes, if we can do that, I think verification validation time can go down substantially. Where does security fit into risk five? And Navid, you mentioned it earlier. Uh, that was an important, you think, one of the in a killer applications in the security side. Uh, but where does it fit into the ecosystem? Where do we, um, I mean, right now we've, we, uh, Intel and AMD and ARM are dealing with Spectre and Meltdown, but those were microarchitecture side effects. We haven't gotten to the point where uh, the architecture is uh, mature enough to be attacked in that way. But where do you see that long term? How does security fit into RISC-V? Yeah, so it's, it's got to do with just the openness and the clean slate. It's clearly what I call a huge opportunity for RISC-V to leverage uh, the opportunity from a clean slate point of view. Other companies, processor companies, grew up when security was just not a care about, and now all of a sudden everyone cares about security. They, they, they have to basically patch it in. But that doesn't mean that it's like it's a done deal that RISC-V is going to win on security. So there's a lot of work to be done. From the very beginning, if you go to look at RISC-V workshops, there's a number of security papers from all over the world uh, using RISC-V. And there are startups that, that are based on RISC-V that are, have security IP and security technology. One is called Dover Microsystems. And Naveed mentioned the DARPA, uh, Linton Salmon is running a program. I forget the name of the program, but it's all it's it's Risk Five based. So I think there's going to be a lot of research, uh, security research based on Risk Five. Just yesterday, in fact, I had a meeting with uh, Paul Coker, who's the, the uh, guy who discovered Spectre, and David Patterson, and we're talking about how to bring this this uh, vision to fruition of you know clean slate design for security, and we're definitely committed to making that happen. And there's definitely I call it a meeting. Point. RISC-V is a natural meeting place for people who, who, who care about these things. 
things to go talk about security. I mentioned Paul Coker's uh, interested in, in contributing to Risk Five. There's a company called Data Sixty One, based in uh, Australia. Also had one of the co-authors of the paper on Meltdown Inspector. They're participating in Risk Five. So the leading experts in security are all coming to Risk Five. Uh, we hope that it becomes part of the standard. I mean, it's key aspects become part of the standard, but we also think it's an opportunity to differentiate. So you can take RISC V and come up with a killer uh, IoT product with your own proprietary secret. RISC V is should be your substrate for that. So the problem with security today is that there is a let's say a issue with the ARM processor. The people who are going to be finding a solution to that are all the people which work for that company. Even in those companies, not everybody fully understands the instruction set. Look at x86. Today, x86 has 3,556 odd instructions. The base instruction set of RIX-5 is, I think, what, 53? Something like that. Is it possible for somebody to really master all those instructions and all the millions of ways it gets used? It's, not, it's, it's difficult, right? When the entire intellectual set is those 10, 20, 30, 50 people. So the biggest difference in risk 5 is first it's open so there is no secret instruction number one or there you're not aware of second a very large group of international security experts who can work together to solve the problem and when a security hole shows up then the amount of headcount that can be applied is not limited to one company but Hundreds and thousands of people all over the world would be figuring out how to solve this problem and better solutions will emerge. So I think this openness, number one, is, and not having a legacy of 3,500 instructions combined together, I think gives me the most hope. The third thing is the scalability of the architecture. I think we should not talk about trading off performance with security. Let's say there is in a stack, there is a payment processor, right? The banks are using. Do they really need the most world greatest performance? Would they be willing to give up 10, 20, 30 percent performance if we can say that it has the end-to-end -end crypto security? Right? Would that be better for them? I think they would actually say, yeah, build me a core that or build me the entire you know, end-to-end -end security. Okay, it's 10, 20, 30 percent uh, less fast. I'm okay with that or it consumes more power. I'm okay with that, but give me the security. I think with this kind of an architecture, it is possible to micro-architect those solutions which are more scalable and but more secure and we can trade off those things. So these are the three things that, in my mind, why I think security is a killer app. I, I think in the next five, ten years, it is going to become apparent because if you look at IoT, the where the cars are going, the biggest issue we are going to have in cars is security. People should not be able to hack into our cars. People should not be able to hack into our refrigerators, our home security systems, right? So I think security is going to be very important, and I think in a new, fresh architecture, because we just, we just have a legacy, scalability, security can be done easier as compared to others. Well, it does look like we have a consensus here that openness is the best defense for security, right? So when we bring in all these all kind of resources and expertise into this uh, security uh, issues, I'm sure that when everybody, when everybody knows what's going on, so you will see a lot less the uh, security uh, loophole. Uh, and, and the only thing I want to highlight is that uh, conventionally the security expertise actually reside in industry mostly in industry. And I know that Risk 5 Foundation is on the right track to acquire those expertise from the industry to make uh, the standard even robust. Uh, so I think it's on the right track. And in the long run, I truly believe that Risk 5 security side, it's gonna be stronger than everything you've ever seen before. Because now you have all kind of expertise, resources, right, and openness. It's gonna be a lot better than a proprietary security feature that resides in a single company. So my other day job is running a security foundation, so a nonprofit called Purple. And I recently presented a paper at another conference that was titled, Why Risk Five Will Become the Most Secure Processor uh, in the Next Five Years. And now we touched on some of those items here. Uh, fundamentally, Naveed touched on the lower attack surface associated with the, the small instruction set. We all know about the openness. But because we're able to work together openly, we're also able to work on things like crypto extensions. So what are the proper crypto extensions? What is gonna be the root of trust philosophy? What is the privileged execution environment? What, what kind of hypervisor modes are we supporting? 
we are able to span the entire gamut and we have a very active security working group uh, in Risk Five. And what's really nice is it's open enough that people who are, for instance, associated with Purple's security working group can participate. And so we're getting lots of industry crossover and lots of expertise brought to bear. So I encourage you, if security is an interest, think about joining the security working group. All right, I'm going to open it up uh, for audience participation.